You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner. Everybody is concerned about the Ukraine. There are 300,000 Jews that live in Ukraine. Everybody's in danger because of what's happening between the war Russia has waged on Ukraine. We're going to go live to the Ukraine, to the border. With us right now is Shoma Roselio, the head of Hatsola, Ukraine. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Thank you for having me. When, you, when I say the border, can you define exactly where you are? So I am in between uh, Ukraine and Moldova, which is uh, another, uh, another country next to Ukraine. It's about, uh, like I said, in a good day, an hour and a half drive, but now it's about seven hours drive to the border. So when people come here, they, they come very, uh, very tired, you know, hungry, and it's not fun. It's now, a lot was, of waiting time. Uh, you say it, it takes a long, it took an hour and a half drive. Now it's about a seven hour drive to get there. Yeah. Are you seeing action? Is there fighting going on where you are? So, so in the past couple of uh, maybe maybe 24 hours, we've seen uh, spikes in, uh, in attacks in Odessa, which is Odessa was a safe haven till now, in a way. It was uh, pretty quiet, was nothing going on uh, until this moment. And it started, it started tonight and it's, uh, it's getting through the day. Also uh, started to be a lot of attacks. So, so it's getting here. But you can see all the time, you can see soldiers, you can see tanks all over. You can see uh, roadblocks, you know, and, uh, and all this, this type of things. Yeah, definitely. Now, is Moldova also involved in the fight? In the war? No, Moldova is trying to stay away. It's, um, Moldova is uh, basically known as a pro-Russian country in a way, okay? They don't want to mess with the Russians, but at the same time, they don't want to fight with them. But uh, according to what I hear, Moldova is next. Moldova is next as far as the conflict is concerned. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. A lot going on. Now, tell us about uh, Hatsola Ukraine. Is this a relatively new organization or from what I understand you've been around for a while? So uh, Hatsola Ukraine was uh, formed in uh, about seven years ago um, by me. I didn't start it as something. I, I, I mean, I didn't know it's going gonna, it's gonna to get to such, uh, such extents. But uh, when, when we started it, we had a lot of, um, a lot of um, humanitarian help uh, that we gave in the war zone in Donetsk and Donbass when, when it started back in the days. We started to give a lot of help there, medical, medications, things like this. Then we expensed more hospitals. We gave a lot of help to in, in hospitals, mostly kids' hospitals around Ukraine. Uh, the reason for that is that in Ukraine, uh, usually when you go to the hospital, uh, you know, you, you, the doctor sees you, you have everything. He doesn't need to ask you to do anything. But when you come to a doctor in Ukraine, they give you a list of stuff. And at the top of the list, there is gloves because they got nothing. They don't have syringes. They don't have anything. You have to, they give you, the doctor gives you a list of stuff. You go to the pharmacy downstairs, you buy everything. You come back to the doctor and then he does everything he does. So the hospital does not provide even the most minimalistic uh, equipment and stuff that the doctor needs in order to take care of the patient. So at most, we have three hospitals nowadays. Uh, uh, actually, now it's not working, but uh, because uh, the army of Ukraine allocated all the hospitals, even the kids' hospitals, to be working under them. So it's a little bit difficult to, uh, to do that. But we have uh, pharmacies, actual pharmacies, inside kids' hospital, where the people, when they are actually going to the doctor, they get in the list, they go downstairs, and they get it for free. So they don't need to buy the stuff from the hospital. So this is, uh, this is mainly what we do. We help people. We do a uh, med vac for Jewish people. We help every Jew that is getting into troubles here in Ukraine and cannot, you know, and doesn't have the ability to actually go ahead and take care of himself and, uh, and speak to the people. We always give advice on the phone. We uh, we uh, we there for every person that has a medical issue in Ukraine. And we've done that for seven years. So now your role has changed. So tell us, what is what are you doing now? You're th there are 300,000 Jews in Ukraine. What is Hatsol Ukraine doing? So until today, we have transferred over 700 people from approximately five regions of Ukraine into the border. 
some of them to the border of Moldova, some of them to the border of Romania, some of them to the border of Poland. Uh, and uh, you have to understand an operation of 700 people, it's not a small operation. Uh, just, to, just, to, um, just so people will understand, 40 people max can go into a big bus that carries 60 people. The reason is because people come with strollers, suitcases and things like this, and you can't tell them not to bring anything. And that's the reason why about 40 people. So if you divide that, you're talking about hundreds of uh, buses going in and out in an operation that has to expand. And now at the same time, we have to respect each person. So most of the time we have problems, not a problem, of course, but when we have a Jewish community coming into the bus and there is a non-Jew coming in and saying, listen, I want to join in, I would say definitely come into the bus. I would never say no. So that's sometimes expand more and because there's a lot of people on the street and they see the people going on the bus they are right away asking you going to moldova you're going to another border so you have to accommodate them as such and you cannot discriminate so you have to add more buses and more things so and that operation is very difficult for many many reasons first of all it costs a lot of money fortune the the buses ranges from six thousand dollars to twelve thousand dollars depends where you're going depends where you are depends what's the risk of the driver on top of that, you have the risk of the world. You have to have a convoy. Sometimes you have to have security. Sometimes you have all kinds of things that adds up to the value of that thing. And that's, um, that's devastating because we, can't, we cannot accommodate all of the requests of all the people. But we're trying to do our best to have whoever we can to help them get to safe haven across the border and to a safe place. And definitely women and children are a top priority for us. So how large is your organization as far as getting people moving and re renting buses? You must have volunteers or people. You know, on the some, someone, someone asked me the same question today. Um, and I was thinking about it for a minute and I could not answer. And the reason that I could not answer because there is days that I have 50 people. There's days that I have 100 people working with me. And there's days that it's only me. And, and the reason for that is because you have to understand we are in a war zone. It's very difficult to have people working here. Most of the foreigners already left. There is no foreigners in Ukraine. They have time on their, you know, on their hand to come and, and, and help and do things like this. So we take Ukrainian people. Most of them have families, kids, wives, whatever, girlfriends, no matter what. And, and at the end of the day, eventually they have pressure from their family who lives here, who lives there to leave because they're afraid to get hurt or they, they need to take their family to safety or, or things like this. So it's always varies. We don't have, uh, you know, we don't have a stable operation when it comes to volunteers, even though we are trying to get um, a stable, you know, system, but it's very difficult when you're in a war zone. I know that I have my own to myself and this is the only thing that I'm counting on. Now, do we have any idea as to how many casualties have been so far within the Jewish community? Do we have any idea? Within the Jewish community, not a lot, about three or four. Uh, but you have, to, you have to understand that we, it's very difficult to count the uh, local uh, Jewish, you know. Uh, we talk about foreigners, but this is what I know, three or four. Uh, that's what I heard. I heard about one for sure. And there's all kind of rumors going around, but uh, speculations, I don't have any proof to that. I've been getting calls, all kind of calls. I have, uh, I have a person that is Jewish, an American Jewish, that I'm trying to take care of him. Uh, he, he died uh, natural causes, nothing to do with this. He died in a, in a very difficult place to reach, and he doesn't have a death certificate and things like this. So now we're trying to get it done. Uh, God willing, we're going to be able to, but I don't know. We're speaking with Shlomo Roselio. He's the head of Hatsol Ukraine. We're speaking to him at the border uh, between Ukraine and Moldova. Educate us, because it seems to me that there are lots of different groups that are looking to help the Jews in the Ukraine. Is everybody working together? Is it independent? Tell us what's going on. So Ukraine is, is a big country. It's not a small country. It's a huge country. And there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of Jews here. And there's also a lot of foreigners. From what, not, from what I know, 98% of the foreigners that has been in Ukraine have left. I'm talking about Jewish, religious, or whatever it is. But Jewish people, foreigners left. 
They're not there. The people well, Israel, were, pulled out, Israel pulled out its people, right? Again, again? Israel pulled out a lot of its uh, staff and people from Ukraine. Um, well, yes, no. I, I can confirm that, but I can tell you that I did a lot. I can tell you that at some point I felt like I am the Israeli embassy and the U.S. embassy together. And, uh, and it was very difficult because when I was trying to get help from them, I haven't got any help. The phones were not answered. Problems that I had, I had to solve myself without the help of the embassy. And many, many problems like this have caused me to understand that in time of, of stress and seriousness, they're all gone. They were not there for us. Because, and, they, because they left the country? Because I know they evacuated the Israeli they, citizens. They left the country and it was a chaos and they just crashed. They collapsed. They could not handle this. And uh, unfortunately, but they, this, this, is, uh, this is the situation. It's reality. So basically, I was taking care of most of those people. Um, I put a lot of effort into it. But I had to do it. Somebody had to do it, you know. So when you say whatever, was, you, got, you, you got them out of the country. What did you do for, the, let's say, Israeli? I, I got them out of the country. Um, I helped them to get out of those cities where they were. I, and I got them out of the country eventually. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so Israel, unfortunately, wasn't as much help as you thought it would be because they had they evacuated the citizens of Israel. Now, what about all these other groups that are operating in, in Ukraine? We're seeing a lot of publicity in the United States, different groups. That are, so I started, you... the, yeah, I started to answer that question. I'm sorry. So basically, Ukraine is a very, a very big country. There's a lot of regions, a lot of cities, and there's a lot of Jewish people here also. People don't know, but almost 50% of the Ukrainians are Jewish. 50% of the Ukrainian so, population is Jewish? What yes, number? Yes. How, how large is the Ukraine? How many people... Are they in Ukraine? I think it's 40 million. You're saying 20 million are Jewish? Yeah. By roots. They're not. They're not. They're not oh, Jewish. roots. They're okay. Not, yeah. They're not, yeah. They're not Jewish. I mean, their okay. mother, their grandfather, this, that. They, they, have, they have Jewish roots. Now, the problem comes in, there is a lot of communities, Chabad communities mostly. There's some Litvish and Hasidic here and there, but not a lot. But mostly Chabad communities. They are helping those people, you know, all year long. They, they, they're helping them. They're giving them food. They, they, they're helping all those communities. And what happened is when, when, when we got to that point where, where there is such an extent of, of, of a disaster and a situation because of this war, all the people tried to hang up, you know, hang on their rabbis of the community to take them out and help them to go. So, but they cannot accommodate all of them. So all of a sudden you see like mushrooms, a lot of, uh, you know, chesed funds coming up and all kind of uh, uh, fundraising and things like this. I said in one of the meetings that we had with, with some, some of the uh, local uh, leaders, uh, rabbis and things like this, I said, listen, guys, you guys need to work together. You can't just spread around and open, you know, 20, 30, 40 fundraising. We're not going to get anywhere. We have to regroup and try to do it together. And this way, it's gonna work much better. But then you see there's a lot of people, outsiders, which are not in Ukraine, starting also their campaign. We are taking people out, we're doing this, we're doing that. This is not easy. This is not an easy operation. You can't do that from outside. You have to do it from the inside to outside. You can't do it from, from outside and say, I'm taking people. You cannot work with anybody here. To get a bus here, it takes, it takes you three, four days to get a bus, you know? So, so I, I myself see the chaotic situation right now when it comes to all those fundraising. And unfortunately, I'm trying to stay away from politics, but this is causing a lot of people a lot of pain. So you're saying that there are a lot of different Chabad groups that exist there that that are working independently. There's no umbrella group. What about the chief rabbi, exactly. the chief rabbi of Ukraine? Aren't you working with him? Who is the chief rabbi of Ukraine? Rabbi Blythe. I didn't know that he's the chief rabbi of Ukraine. Okay, Nobody I'm... told me that. <laughs> so who's the chief rabbi? If you, he's, the, he's the chief, at least we've had him I know, on over I the know years. Who's, I know who's the chief rabbi of Odessa. It's Rabbi Avram Wolf. 
and he's uh, he's a great man. They're doing a lot for the people that uh, are in here in his uh, in his community. Um, I don't want to talk about other groups or other people. I know there's people that made a lot of money and fortune, and people asking them to help, but they're not helping. I spread yes, my wings all over the place and I try to do the best I can for each and every person that gives me a call. If I can't do it, if I didn't try the hardest, I would tell them, listen, this is the person that maybe fits better to the job than me. But I would never hang up on a person. But Shlomo, it seems that from what I hear that despite the, that the danger that Ukrainian Jews are in, there's a splintering among everybody doing their own thing. So it just makes the situation even more chaotic and much more problematic if everybody's not working together. I mean, you don't, you know, this one doesn't like this one. This one doesn't acknowledge that one. So it makes it much harder. Isn't there a mechanism or a way to get, or this is a dangerous situation. Lives are a danger. Is there any way to get everybody together? I wish. I, I don't know the, I, I don't know the formula. I couldn't figure it out. Okay. And I, are you I getting, couldn't. Now you're the head of 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 Hatsola, Ukraine Hatsola. Are you getting assistance from groups outside the United, outside the Ukraine? I'm not. So you operate strictly on your own device. So you're not getting help from Jewish groups or I, any other. I mean, so far no, but I would love to get help, and I would love to people to reach out to me for help. And same way, the other way, I need help, and I need a lot of help. And, uh, and I can't do it myself, but I'm trying and I'm doing my best and I'm here. If anybody needs my help, I will be available for that 24 hours a day. Now, how can people get a hold of you, by the way? Uh, trust me, my phone is blowing up. Uh, it's on my <laughs> website. I did not hide it. I have my email there. I have everything there. It's all public. I did not hide anything. I get messages. You know, text messages, WhatsApp, phone calls all over the place. And uh, my phone does not, you know, just always ringing, always. Now, and, and, and just so people can look up Hatsala Ukraine online and get in touch with you. HatsalaUkraine.org, yeah. Now, let me ask you, there are reports that the bombings have been indiscriminate, including destroying Bombay R. Can you talk to us about that? So I, I don't know if destruction is the word. It got hit. I've seen the pictures. It got hit. Um, I don't know if it's a complete destruction, but it got hit, and it's, uh, there's a lot to fix there. I've been in Babi Yar a couple times in my life, and I know how it looks like when it's complete, but it's not complete. Okay, and what about the, have there been shuls destroyed, the cemeteries, so far, institutions? So far, none. Bar Hashem. We haven't heard of anything, but you have to understand also that there's a lot of places that's being bombed and the people can't go out, so we cannot get any intel. So that's another problem. So it could be that hap something happened, but we don't know. But, it's, but so far, the internet and the phones are working throughout the country or not? That's surprisingly, yes. Sometimes no, but surprisingly, it's still working stable. Oh, that is surprising. I'm surprised that the Russians didn't cut that's it off. Very surprising. Very surprising. But sometimes you don't, all of a sudden, you don't have a phone for like two or three hours. And sometimes overnight you don't have a phone, and then it comes back. But it's still stable uh, as far as, uh, you know, surprisingly, the Russians didn't destroy the system. Interesting. Shoma Rosilio is our guest. He's the head of Hatsol Ukraine, a group that he founded about seven years ago. So this is a, 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 a did you, let me ask you this, Shoma, you, they've been talking about, uh, Russia been talking about for a long time about invading Ukraine. Did you actually think it was going to happen? Um, you're asking me a very tough question. I, 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 I wanted to believe that it wouldn't happen, but deep inside, I know that he's serious. Well, because it's uh, something. So in other words, the reason why I asked you that question, was there any way for the Jewish groups to prepare for this eventuality? Oh, everybody prepared. Oh, there was. So what kind of preparation did Every, you have? Well, we bought tons of food. We stocked on medical supply. We stocked on fuel. We stocked on uh, on generators and uh, and uh, fuel for the generators. Uh, mostly, mostly medical supply and food. That was the that was the top priority. But that also was very difficult because a lot of people tried to do that the same the same time because we had, I think maybe uh, maybe a month 
to prepare ourselves since since the beginning of this uh, this uh, army uh, you know the, the, the thing that Putin did the when he started to bring all the uh, all the forces around surrounding Ukraine and everybody was thinking that he's just joking and he's just doing you know just uh, training with uh, with his army but uh, a lot of people saw the future and they knew that if he's bringing such an extent power you know near Ukraine that means that he's going to do something that everybody will uh, you know be devastated afterwards so we started we packed stuff uh, but that's not enough I promise you now Ukraine it's all as a volunteer organization where are you getting the volunteers from um, well right now only Ukrainian we don't have any other volunteers uh, at the moment the reason is because it's very risky operation uh, we talking about a war zone a war zone it's not a it's not a playground we, we're not going to do a, you know we're not going to a festival here this means I have been, you know, uh, the other day, I think it was last week, um, Sunday. No, Motsi Shabbos. It was Motsi Shabbos last week. Call me uh, Rabbi, it was uh, Rabbi Hartman, I think. Gave me a call, Motsi Shabbos, tell me, listen, I need to go. And, and there's, uh, there's a mandatory car for you. You can't go out. Everything is closed. Everything is shut down. So it told me, I need to go to the orphanage. I want to bring them some uh, some candies. All shops were worn there. I want to bring them candies to make the kids happy and this and that. And I said, listen. And where, where's the um, orphanage that we're talking about? So we're talking about Odessa orphanage. Okay? Odessa, okay. Yeah, a Jewish uh, Chabad orphanage that uh, they did not evacuate for many reasons, but they haven't left. And he told me, let's go. Isn't that, da- isn't that dangerous they didn't evacuate an orphanage in the middle of a war zone? So uh, we wanted to take them out, but we couldn't. Uh, the reason that, that we couldn't do it because uh, some of the kids don't have papers and it's very difficult to get papers right now so uh, the decision was made to stay um, but we took them to a safe place they're, they're in, in a place where they are safe for now so hopefully it's going to stay this way so basically he called me and he asked me to come with the ambulance I have an ambulance, uh, an Israeli ambulance uh, you probably you guys can see it on pictures uh, if you google it uh, we have a mother ambulance that uh, was donated to us uh, and it got, it got from Israel to us. So basically, I told him, okay, no problem. I'm going to come. I came. I took him. I took him to the orphanage. The orphanage is near the water, near the, near the beach, okay? And I did not know until that day how dangerous that could be. We went there around 11 o'clock at night. I dropped him off, and I went down the street to make a U-turn to go back and wait for him. As soon as I went to the end of the street, the end of the street is about the water, I, had, I was surrounded by 20 soldiers with gun pointing at me. Ukrainian soldiers? Ukrainian soldiers, gun point, screaming their head off to put my head out of the window and my hands. And I was there for 20 minutes. They hold me. They did not want to see any documents. They did not want to see anything. I was with an ambulance. I was, you know, with a vest and everything. And uh, they just hold me like this with gunpoint for 20 minutes until one of them came, you know, very cautiously to me, opened the door, tell me to come out and lay on the floor. They try to start checking me. And then they asked me for where's my, where's my, uh, my passport, my this, my that. I told them where it is, told me don't move. They start checking the ambulance upside down. I'm not joking. They took everything apart, the whole ambulance. For almost an hour, they hold me down. They check my papers. They check everything that I have. And then they ask me for something to give them. And then they release me. Yeah? And then they release me. So you have so to did understand you, did, did you have to pay, did you have to Did you have to pay them? I gave him, I gave him some pretzels that I had in my car and uh-huh. things like this. I had some, some uh, all kind of snacks. I gave him all the snacks and everything. They asked me if I can get, bring the medical supply. And I told them that I do my best to try to uh, to uh, accommodate them as much as I can, but I ran away. <laughs> wow! But that's that, that's was, was that's that your scariest extent. was that your scariest moment so far? Um, that one of them. I've been uh, I've been in a cross of fire one time uh, this week, but wow. uh, I mean, not not literally inside, but I was right there near it, and it was uh, visible to me in front of my face. I had to go out, go behind the ambulance, hide, whatever, until it's uh, going to be over. But you have to understand, this is a war zone. It's a very dangerous area. I cannot protect anybody. If people want to volunteer, they're welcome to come. It's going to be very difficult to go into Ukraine in any way. But 
Uh, we are welcoming anybody that wants to come and help us. Absolutely. Any kind of help will be helpful. Listen, I, we empathize and we, we want to be as much support as we can. I just wish everybody can get together with a united front, but you're doing a wonderful job of saving and helping people. I'm referring to that solo Ukraine. Shishloma Roselio, thank you for joining us. Let's give out the information again for people who want to help you get involved in what you're doing. It's hatsalaukraine.org, H-A-T-Z-A-L-A-H, ukraine.org. That's, that's our website. May God keep you safe and rescue Thank as so many much. people as possible. Thanks Thank for you listening. For, the for continuous Jewish programs, right. hawklinenetwork.com. Thank you so much. For our day listen line at 641-741-0389. For past shows, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Instagram, and all major podcast platforms or jewishpodcast.org. Thanks for listening to the talklinenetwork.com. Talkline Network Talkline.